before I um, start, <coughs> I just want to acknowledge that all of this work has been done in collaboration with a number of people, um, specifically Amy McLennan and Stanley Ulexet from Medical Anthropology here in Oxford, Mason Porter, Walid Atman, and Rodrigo Mendoza in Mats, uh, Mauricio Varona, Sofia Jaliraki, and Elias Bamis in Mathematics in Imperial College, Elmer and um, Guillermo Garduño in Senia, who's a data analytics company that provides us with a lot of data, and David O'Sullivan and James Gleason in Limerick. Um, so I am a mathematician, and, and uh, although this is not a mathematics talk, I thought it would be useful to explain to you how I approach these types of pro uh, problems. So um, the main object that I work with is a, is a network or a graph, which is a mathematical object, which is just a collection of entities, nodes, and their relationships, edges, right? So, and that is it. <clears throat> and that's a very useful way to represent many systems. And it allows us to use um, a whole range of mathematical uh, and computational tools to, to start asking questions about the system that we're interested in. So a graph, this is a network, so you have the nodes, you have the connections, and in a computer then we represent this as, a, as an adjacency matrix, which is number of nodes by number of nodes, it has non-zero entries when we um, see a, um, a connection. For instance, six and one are connected, so we see in the one comma six, uh, one, right? <coughs> and, and this is a very useful way to represent the network, then because we can leverage you know, 200 years of, of linear algebra and other types of uh, mathematical tools to really crunch these, these guys. Right? And networks come in many different flavors. So you have the most basic type of network is an undirected, um, unweighted network where you just have nodes and edges and you just care about whether the nodes are connected or not. You can have weights in the connections that um, you can use it to represent the intensity of our, of our relationships. For, for instance, <laughs> you may have that two nodes are connected, they're <coughs> friends on Facebook and the nodes represent people, and then you might add some weight to the number of messages that these um, nodes have exchanged. So that allows you to represent that here. <coughs> you, ha you can have a directed network in which the, the, the connection have a specific direction. So um, a connection has an origin and a destination, and that may mean many different things. For instance, in Twitter, it might mean that I follow Lady Gaga and she refuses to reciprocate, <laughs> right? Um, graphs can be temporal, so the edges might exist for a specific interval in time. They can be of different type. For instance, if you think about the transportation network, you can have the street, the buses, the trains, the airplanes, and so on. So it depends on what your problem, well, what data or what system you're analyzing, you'll have to make a careful choice of the type of network that you're going to use to represent your system. And that's going to permeate to the f types of questions that you can answer and what, what the data may tell you. And of course, as I said before, networks are an incredibly versatile um, way to represent a variety of systems. You can represent metabolism, you can represent ecological food webs, you can represent social networks, you can represent uh, even more general things like flux, online social networks. <laughs> and once you've translated all of these incredibly complex systems into a nice network mathematical object that you know how to analyze, then the rest follows. You can, you can start asking questions, right? Um, today, I'll talk about Twitter. Um, uh, I spend a lot of time working on Twitter data and analyzing um, um, and, and asking questions about what people do on Twitter and what we can learn from it. So for those of you who don't know, I hope you all know, uh, Twitter is a, just an, a, an online social medium that you can post short messages up to 140 characters or now they doubled it, I think, for some people. Uh, and the nice thing about it is that you can subscribe to other people's uh, tweets so you can follow and, and it's a very dynamic kind of environment that moves quite quickly. Um, so, which brings us to the cheesy metaphor of the title, so X-rays and stethoscope. And yes, I admit it's kind of corny. But the point about this is that um, on systems like Twitter, you can get some data and then you can start <coughs> to ask questions. Um, and depends on the data that you gather, the questions that you ask and how you model it as a network, uh, it'll tell you different things about the ensemble of Twitter users that you have. So you can have an x-ray which shows you the bones and the bones are semi-static structures. They grow very slowly. You know, they remain, you can almost um, 
consider them fixed. And perhaps Twitter data that you look at, uh, if you want to see things that don't move a lot in society, then you're going to have to ask for a specific type of data. Or a stethoscope that you measure the pulse. The pulse changes rather quickly in different circumstances. You can accelerate your pulse and then come back to your normal level. And for that type of questions of, of things that are just transitory effects or things that are evolving rapidly, um, you could also use Twitter data to ask these questions, but you're going to have to do it in a different way. Right? For instance, uh, you can build a network of, of Twitter users, a directed network of Twitter users, by looking at who follows whom. And those are explicit declarations of general interest. So I follow someone else is because I'm interested in the content <coughs> that that person creates. So there's an explicit connection going from me to that person, which denotes interest, and then the information flows in the opposite direction. And people tend to follow uh, others that uh, produce content that interests them. And that doesn't change very fast. It changes, but not too fast. So we, I understand these uh, declarations of interest as more general things. Uh, but you can, do, you can have conversations on Twitter. You can mention someone in a tweet. And then again, you create a directed connection from you to the person that you mentioned. And the difference here is that that connection exists in the context of a tweet, which may be topical, may be pertinent to an event, you know, a football match, or something else that's happening just then. It's not really a, an explicit declaration of general interest. It's an explicit declaration of particular interests. So these things change quite quickly. And a mention exists one, one time and may never arise again. Or a retweet, which is a, a particularly interesting one. So I see some interesting bits of content from a person I follow. I think it's worthwhile passing it along, and I pass it along. So again, I explicitly declare this is a bit of content that is interesting. Not the person, uh, perhaps, in general. I may not follow the person. But the, uh, the actual tweet is interesting, and I pass it along. So this is, again, another topical um, uh, interaction. Right? Um, so, so these are the types of networks that I work with. Um, I'll start telling you um, some examples of, of my research and how I've used different networks that we've constructed to ask questions about general interest or specific topical um, events. For instance, in a follower network, well, what does that tell us about the users? You say you have a group of users and you know who follows whom, and then you're tasked to analyze this data. You can ask a bunch of questions. You can say, well, who, uh, which users do the rest of the ensemble regard as important? And how do you define importance? Um, are there groups of users that are kind of more cohesive and more interested in each other than in the rest of the network? Um, are the nodes different? Can I, can I classify them by type? Right? We said before that Lady Gaga and I, even though we may be in the same network, we're definitely not the same. So can we be a little bit more specific about what the same or different means in this context? And then, of course, can we leverage the structure of the network to learn more about what the individuals reveal in isolation? So is the whole more than the sum of its parts? Um, the first example has to do with the UK riots of 2011. Um, this was um, at least that I was exposed to one of the first uh, truly interesting uh, instances of data journalism that um, I got to see real close. So as you know, the police in London shot and killed a man. There were protests uh, which evolved into riots afterwards. And there was a lot of discussion on social media about these riots, Twitter and Facebook and so on. And The Guardian gathered about 2 million tweets about the riots. And then they decided these are the most important users. They, come, they came up with a list of the 1,000 most retweeted accounts during the, the riots. And so, you know, that's how the Guardian chose to the, um, define importance, which was fair enough. So we took this um, list of users and we looked at it and we saw some familiar names. We saw the BBC, we saw Stephen Fry, we saw footballers, but then we saw a bunch of other people that we didn't know who they were. And we were interested in understanding this ensemble of influential users. <coughs> well, who are they? What are they interested? What is their thing? Um, so we went into the Twitter API. We collected 
all the internal edges, the connections, so who follows whom from within this, uh, this, this network. And this is the result, which is a network that we cannot really eyeball easily. Again, it's a lot of connections, very messy. <coughs> it's a complex network. Um, so we said, OK, well, who is important? So one of the obvious things you can do is you can count incoming connections. So you can sort everyone by number of followers. So the Guardian sorted it by number of retweets, which is what other people outside of this, this group regard as important. But internally, how do these guys regard each other? So OK, yes, we can, we can look at the top whatever accounts by number of followers in this group. And it sort of makes sense. We have Stephen Fry, BBC News, an MP, the Prime Minister's account, WikiLeaks, <coughs> and so on. The problem with doing this type of thing is that, yes, it's very nice, but we are really not exploiting the full structure of the network, right? Because we're just looking at, uh, at uh, each node in isolation and just counting the number of edges that arrive to it. So we can probably do better. And there are many, many notions of importance in a network that measure different things. One that I like particularly is called PageRank, which is how Google ranks its websites. And it's based on the intuition or the, the intuitive way to, to understand PageRank is to think about a, a random walker on the network who's visiting a node and then looks at the outgoing edges and chooses one at random and follows it and so on. And every now and again when it hits a dead end, it just chooses one node uh, at random. And so on it goes on for a very long time. So if, if you have this random walker exploring the network going on and on and on, at some point you can ask, well, what percentage of the time uh, does the random walker spend in node 1 or node 6 or node 3? Right? And in a very long term, this will converge to an answer. And that's what we regard as important. So the most important node, according to this uh, criterion, is the, the node where the random walker tends to spend more most of the time. Right? And that's a very nice way to, to think about importance because it's really exploiting the entire network. Right? And, it, and it's doing it for us. We don't have to follow edges. We just let the mathematics talk. So again, you can formulate this with mathematics. And so if we had our list of top 10 nodes by in degree, so this is the number of followers and it decreases, when we look at page rank, we see something strange. We see that, for instance, to number two, uh, uh, BBC News that has only 138 followers in this network uh, has overtaken Stephen Fry, which has more than 100 uh, more followers. And the reason is because um, you're kind of taking second order declaration. <coughs> so a lot of influential nodes follow BBC News. So therefore, you, if you end up at the, one of these nodes that have many, many followers, you'll immediately go to BBC News and so on. So you can see that once you look at the composition of the, at least the top 10, you start to see that um, this ensemble of groups is really uh, of notes is really interested in news and reporting. Right? So that, that's kind of something nice. Um, another thing that we could ask is, as, a, as I said, is do we find groups of notes that are more interested in each other than what you would expect in a similar size graph with no structure? And this in, in network science is called community detection. And broadly, communities are you know, groups of nodes, and you find more connections than you would expect. That's a community. And it's a very good way to take a large, complex network, find the communities, and reduce it and, and transform it into something easier to understand. Right? But now remember that um, just counting number of connections in a directed graph uh, is kind of problematic because if all the connections, for instance, point outwards, then you're really not, there's no really <coughs> anything cohesive about the group, right? So we can use the same sort of intuition that we use for page rank and use random walkers or diffusion processes and say, well, if you have a diffusion process, for instance, a drop of ink that you put in one of the nodes and the ink follows a directed connection, you say, well, the the pockets of the network or the regions of the network where the ink tends to be trapped for longer than you would expect would be a community. Or in the terms of the random walker, you say if the random walker stays trapped in a region of the network for a very long time, 
then that um, that region would be uh, we could consider it as a community. And the other thing is that we can use then the duration of the diffusion <coughs> process or the duration of the random walk as a resolution parameter. So if the process is short, you don't, we don't let the, the random walkers explore for a very long time, then we're going to find small communities. But if we give them some time and they move on and they explore more, then we'll find larger and larger and larger communities. So th this is kind of an intuitive um, way to understand how interest is um, contained. Because remember, in a follower graph, directed edges uh, mean declarations of interest. So translating the f uh, diffusion analogy to interest, we want to find regions where the interest is contained. So we do something like this. Um, so this is the coarse graining of the riots graph uh, to, to have 15, 16 communities. Um, which we've labeled international media, BBC, celebrities, and music. So this is a, a bird's eye view of the network that is much, much easier to understand. Um, these word clouds here were a visualization that we did just to see whether people would describe uh, themselves in a consistent manner in each community. So in Twitter, you can have a biography. You can have sort of a short tweet to describe yourself, and here, words that appear more frequent in the members of the community then kind of helps us do a reality <coughs> check on our, um, on our aggregation. So what this tells us about the riot is that the people who were deemed important by you know, the whole uh, of Twitter users um, really do come from many, many domains, so many walks of life. You have <coughs> the BBC journalists, international media, you have celebrities, sports people, uh, international activists, the police, and, and riot cleanup. So that was an interesting example. We found a lot of accounts that are connected very quickly to the police in order to help clean up the day after the riot. So these guys appear there, UK politics, and so on. Parody accounts, they always crop up for some reason. Um, and as I was saying, the resolution parameter allows us to scan communities of different size. So this size was roughly here, 15 communities. But we can look at a much more granular um, uh, version of the community, so 150 communities, where we find something like a community for Hackney, a community for Croydon, very localized, a community of telegraph journalists. In the same way, we can take a much coarser um, view of the, of the network and look at four communities where one is roughly international media or entertainers or UK media and a very small but quite cohesive uh, community of BBC <coughs> nodes. So these are <coughs> nodes that resist the diffusion process and still are interested in each other and in no one else. So okay. that's the BBC. Um, <laughs> right. Uh, another thing we can do with the communities and the resolution of the communities is start to see uh, gauge interest or try to come up with a <coughs> prediction of the interest, uh, how interesting is one node to another. Um, for instance, uh, here I've put all of the nodes that belong to the internet um, activist group Anonymous. And then I started to see, well, as I move along the resolution parameter in the communities and communities begin to merge, which merges first? Uh, and who are they, and then who merges them, and then who are they, and so on. So, and that's a way to, again, leverage the whole structure of the network to see, well, these two people are not connected, but given their declared interests and their interest declared interests and so on, um, can we say how near or far they are? Um, well, the first people who join Anonymous are WikiLeaks, Al Jazeera, Human Rights Watch, so that makes sense. Then international media, bloggers and activists, um, standard mainstream media, the New York Times, Associated Press, things like that. Then it goes to UK media, the BBC, uh, politicians, and at the very end, celebrities and footballers. So you can say, well, Rio Ferdinand and Wayne Rooney are not interesting to Anonymous, at least in the context of, of, of Twitter. Right? So this is another way to visualize this information. So if Anonymous is here, who do you see? Um, and 
Well, this slide's just to show that if two people are far away from Anonymous, say, for instance, Stephen Fry and Wayne Rooney, they need not be necessarily close to each other. So this is not a one-dimensional thing. Um, so, for instance, Wayne Rooney, Anonymous is uninteresting, but also is Stephen Fry and vice versa. So this is more like a landscape of interest with directions and, and distances. Um, right. So the other question that I said we could address by looking at follower graphs is um, the types of nodes. And by this, I mean, can we understand the pattern of incoming and outgoing connections at many different uh, lengths in order to classify <laughs> nodes as, uh, of, uh, into different types? So one of the most basic classifications of nodes would be Follow leaders and followers, right? A, a guy who has a lot of incoming connections is a leader, a guy with none is a follower. Um, but also we have more nuanced and interesting bits in between that just don't fit in this one-dimensional picture. Take, for instance, nodes 3 and 7. So they both have one incoming connection and one outgoing connection. But, for instance, 3 is part of a loop of size 3, 7 is part of a loop of size 4. So the, their connectivity is different. They're standing in the <coughs> network in a different way. In the same way, uh, nodes 5 and 10, for instance, one is a pure source, one is a pure uh, sync. These guys belong to the network in different ways. So what we do is we want to get a, a detailed picture of all these little structures in between 5 and 10 and, and classify the nodes um, according to, to how they stand in the network. To do that, we count the number of nodes that are reachable in one step, two steps, three steps, and so on. And the number of nodes that can reach you in one step, two step, three steps, and so on. And we put them in a little list like this. So for instance, one can be reached by three in one step, by four in two steps, four in five steps, and, and so on. Um, um, this is related to those of you who study uh, social networks to a um, type of centrality called CATS centrality, but it's not quite it. Um, and based on these lists of the number of nodes that can reach you and you can reach, we can devise a similarity score between the nodes. So, for instance, um, how alike are the lists? Do they look uh, similar so they can reach a num similar number of nodes? For instance, nodes 5 and 10 would have a similarity of 0 because they look nothing like each other. So this is a number between 0 and 1 that if they're 1 is they're identically connected in the network. The nodes are the same in connectivity patterns, although they might be in different parts of the network and not be neighbors. Uh, if they're zero, is again, completely different type. So again, by looking at paths of different lengths, we go from original network via a construction of a similarity score to a new network that, so, so we drop uh, uninformative uh, similarities, where we have the same nodes, but uh, we have a connection if they are very si if the nodes are very similar or not. So this is a completely different network, which we again analyze with a community detection algorithm, and they say, okay, we find five types of nodes, and then to understand what these nodes represent, we go back to our original follower originally um, follower graph, and see, okay, well, everyone seems to follow the green ones, but they don't follow back. So these guys, let's call them references, because everyone <coughs> pays attention to them. So they put out content, but that's it. There's no, no. The blue ones are also highly followed. Uh, but at least these guys do interact a bit more with, say, the, the purple ones and, and so on. So these guys are, we call them engaged leaders. So they still receive high amounts of attention, but they do interact. So the types of nodes that we find here are institutional accounts, like the New York Times or Associated Press. Here are individual journalists or politicians whose Twitter account is actually their personal Twitter account and do reply and, and so on. Uh, we have an intermediate level of kind of leadership and interaction called mediators and two different types of listeners. The ones that are basically just following the references and the ones that are spread out, diversified listeners. So these got the red ones are interesting because they follow across the board. Um, so now we've classified our nodes into two things. We classify them into communities, so we know what they're interested in. And we classify them into nodes, which we know how they're connected to the network, what the role in the network is. 
So we can put these two things together and then get an even more detailed picture of the, <coughs> of the network because not only we have the interests, <coughs> but we have the roles. So we can say, okay, the community of international media and BBC, they have a lot of references. We'll call those broadcast communities. They are communities of nodes that are in charge of putting stuff out there. Same celebrity, sports, international media and activists and Riot Cleanup is a monologue community because they have a strong component of leaders and a strong component of listeners of the orange type, so the ones that just <coughs> only pay attention to the leaders. So we say, well, maybe the communication dynamics here is more like a monologue. These guys are putting out content and their fans are hearing it, for instance. We have engaged dialogue where we have actual conversations going on, two-way dialogue or a dialogue in public where we have a lot of the red listeners that are di diversified and they're kind of paying attention to these people who engage in dialogue. Um, right. Okay, so beyond follower networks. So that was uh, an example of, say, the, the X-ray, so general interest between people. It doesn't move very fast. But now can we look at topical declarations of interest, <coughs> things that are specific to something, not just in general. Um, and for that, we can um, say, look at retweet or mention networks. And so here the main <laughs> question is, how do people interact with respect to a certain topic? Um, how, do, how does the specific interest, given the topic, is different from the general interest, for instance, uh, the follower networks? And then can we incorporate additional information to enrich this analysis? So the data set in question now is a collection of tweets about the Irish marriage referendum in 2015. Um, in, two in May 2015, Ireland voted whether to legalize sa same-sex marriage or not. And this was highly discussed on Twitter. Um, there was a lot of press. So we collected uh, half a million tweets with these two hashtags, marriage ref and maref, which were the main hashtags used for the online discussion and we decided to analyze it. We collected two weeks uh, just before the, the referendum date. So this, is, this graph shows you here the number of tweets and there are spikes on the debate days. Here's the referendum day and then subsequent reaction. So this is a highly topical data set. Um, a lot of people uh, tweeted sparsely, a few tweets per person, but there were quite a few people who actually also tweeted heavily. So it's a hybrid, a very heterogeneous um, <coughs> ensemble of people between the ones that are kind of going at it, tweeting, very, being very proactive, and the ones that shared an article or replied to someone and so on. And the main questions we wanted to ask from this data set is, well, we wanted to know how do people interact with respect to, the, in the context of the referendum, can we find supporters of voting yes and no based on their interactions? And, um, and how can we employ the sentiment of the text of the tweets in this analysis? So for this, we're going to analyze two networks, the mentioned networks and the follower networks. And we're also going to look at the text of the tweets, which is something that we hadn't done before. Um, so just a note here about the mentions network, because we are interested in conversations that took place, so actual interactions. <laughs> So the, a normal uh, mention network would be directed. I mentioned the president of Ireland, and uh, that's good. But that doesn't mean that the president of Ireland and I had a conversation. If, if the president of Ireland replies to me, then we do have a conversation. So in this case, we're uh, looking at reciprocated mentions networks, so people who have mentioned each other, because that's indicative of, of conversations. So here's a network of the people who are there. This is the follower um, network. These are the communities in different colors. And you can see that there are more or less well-defined communities. There's orange, the uh, purple ones that are sticking out, the green ones, the red ones, the other ones. So if we use this same layout, but the mentions network, and we look at communities there, we see that it doesn't coincide at all. So this, the general interests and the topical interests of this ensemble of users do not match. And this is why it's important to look at both networks and decide which one is the one that we need in order to analyze um, and answer the questions that we want. Um, so, so we're starting to look at this network 
of mentioned tweets, and then we looked at the tweets of these, uh, the sentiment of these mentions. So the emotional charge, so whether a, a, a tweet conveys positive or negative emotions, um, and we give it a score between minus four for very negative, plus four for very positive, zero for neutral or unknown. And we asked, well, is the sentiment of the tweets that I sent correlated with the sentiment that I receive? And the answer is yes, and robustly so. So we did a, um, a randomization test and looked at the correlation between tweets when we randomize the edges and, and the observed uh, correlation is, is way out there. So it's, it's highly significant. The correlation is modest, but it, the, the in and out sentiment are, um, are correlated. So if I tweet negativity, I'm going to receive negativity. And interestingly, uh, people, well, in the mentions network, not so much, but in the follower network, people tend to follow uh, others that have um, that are aligned in their sentiment of their tweets. So here we have in in yellow is the follower network, in blue is the mentions network, and these are connections between people who are positive, two positive users, and we find that we observe way more connections between positive users in both networks that we would observe uh, at random fewer connections that we would um, between positive and negatives and positives and unknowns, more connections between both negatives, so um, this is more in the mentions network but slightly more in the, uh, in the follower network we, we see some of them, and then connections between negatives and unknowns uh, of, of people with unaligned sentiment, we observe fewer of those connections. So uh, the leap of death that we did here was well if, if sentiment, the sentiment that I send is correlated with the sentiment that I receive, and people with similar sentiment um, tend, to be, are more, um, tend to be more connected to each other than not, let's treat um, sentiment alignment as a proxy for homophily. Right? So if people tweet with the same sentiment, we say that they tend to cluster to each other, with each other. And, and this, um, making this assumption, which might be questionable, but um, but we decided it was not completely outrageous to make. Uh, we decided, okay, given that, can we find yes or no supporters? So we've <coughs> taken that information, we've taken the communities in the, in the follower network, the communities in the mention network, we're taking the intersection of those communities, so people who, are, who talk to each other and also follow each other. We found little, little groups. And then of those intersected groups, we look at the sentiment, the in and out sentiment of those, which is what we plot here. So these, these little dots here are the, inter, the nodes that are in the same communities in both networks. And we here we have the sentiment out and sentiment in. And we find that we can divide these little community clusters into three mega clusters, which is the red ones that are here, the green ones that are here, and the blue ones. So then I asked my PhD student to go and look at a sample of people here and, and try to gauge what, um, uh, what, what type of users they are. So it turns out that uh, people in the red uh, communities, they, have, they tweet out negative sentiment, they receive negative sentiment, and overwhelmingly support voting no. People in the green community, it's a more moderate because they have negative conversations with the reds and positive conversations with the blues. And they overwhelmingly support voting yes. And then the, the guys in blue po you know, tweet positivity far and wide. So we decided to classify this as no community. Um, the green ones as an active yes. So that was a debate. There was a, this, this boundary here is a boundary of debate a lot of conversations took place there across community lines. And then the people who just you know, tweet positive things, they're broadly supportive of the referendum, but they don't engage in a lot of conversations. And, and the accuracy that we achieved with this classification was about 80%. Mm. OK, so moving on from a topical <laughs> thing that was very constrained in time to more um, spatially, uh, things that are, have a temporal dimension that is longer. So the marriage referendum, we've aggregated two weeks of tweets, and we'll all put them in the same, um, 
in the same uh, network. But now uh, we are interested in, in trends and how things move around. Um, this is a collaboration with Amy and Stanley over in Medical Anthropology who were interested in understanding the conversation about diabetes online. They, that's what they study. They study obesity and diabetes. And they asked me whether we can know um, what do people tweet about when they tweet about diabetes and who is influential and who facilitate access to this content. So we took about a year, slightly less than a year, of every tweet in English that contain, contains the term diabetes and we've analyzed it. So that's the blue line here. The vertical lines indicate weeks. So you can see there's a roughly weekly pattern. Um, the red line I'll talk about later is a mathematics joke and, and, and the green one as well. So uh, what do people talk about? Who creates the, who posts the important content and, and who facilitates access to this content? Who distributes it? For this, we use a different notion of importance called hub and authority, which is um, also one of these um, centrality metrics inspired by analyzing the web. And they're defined, uh, there's a circular definition of them. So a good authority is, well, authority, an, the authority score of a node is, is high if it's pointed at by many good authority hubs. And you're a good, authority, uh, good hub if you point out many authorities, right? So it's kind of like a circular definition, but it, uh, it, it makes sense. Um, <clears throat> and we have uh, created a week, weekly network. So for every week, we've been all the retweets. These are, uh, we're going to look at retweet uh, networks per week, and then a sequence of them in time. So one way to understand what we're doing with hubs and authorities is is by looking at it from a slightly different angle. So you can, um, the hu you can extract the hub and authority scores by looking at two deri networks derived from your original retweet network. So one is the co-citation projection, in which two nodes who have been retweeted by a third user are connected. So if I tweet something, <coughs> Taha tweets something, and the same person retweets us both, Taha and I would be connected in this co-citation projection. It means that Taha and I share an audience. Um, likewise, a bibliographic projection um, is if, I, if someone tweets some interesting bit, I retweet it, and then Taha retweets it, um, or actually, uh, yeah, then he and I would be connected in the bibliographic projection. That means Taha and I share interests. So we're interested in the same thing. And turns out the, the authority score is um, centrality metric in this network, and the bibliographic projection gives us the authority score, I mean the hub score. Um, so this is the top 10 authorities. So we can compile about 40 or so thousand um, nodes, so we rank them from highest authority, <coughs> highest <laughs> aggregate authority. So we've taken the authority score in each week and added it together. But these are the top 10, and the top 10 is it's an interesting list because we see a variety of of, of people and, and entities here. So the number one is uh, called Diabetes Facts. And the number 10 is called Everyday Health. So Everyday Health is a publishing company that owns Diabetes Facts. And, and these are accounts that tweet advice about how to live with diabetes, should you drink the certain juice, should you do <laughs> yoga in the morning, things like that. Um, they're advertising agencies, once you dig in but they still command the attention of a lot of people and they're very, very powerful. So they have two accounts in the top 10. Um, so that surprised my colleagues uh, in anthropology quite a bit because the <laughs> public policies and the advice they give to policymakers uh, do not incorporate for these kind of shadowy figures that tweet things as if they were experts in health, but they're not. They're trying to sell you things. Um, we have social media advocates um, we have diabetes uh, organizations like JDRF that funds research into juvenile diabetes, uh, Diabetes Association of America, World Diabetes Day. We have pharmaceutical companies. And then we can see, well, what is the trend? For instance, um, JDRF, which is one of the big funders of diabetes research, has been losing um, audience, uh, whereas Diabetes Facts has been gaining it. <coughs> So this is the type of information that we can extract when we look at temporal um, centrality um, scores. 
then we can go a little bit further. Again, we said, right, so the retweet structure of the graph gave us the top thousand authorities, let's say. But then how these thousand authorities, well, who are they? And we're not going to really analyze a thousand accounts by hand. So we need to do something. So we take in these thousand authorities, looked at the follower graph, and did our trick, look at the communities and see what happens. So, so these are them. So we have a, the biggest community is, unsurprisingly, a community of nodes devoted to diabetes in many capacities. The, but the second largest one, and the one that commands the most attention, is a community of medical schools, hospitals, health experts. Then we have uh, health news and reporting. We have lifestyle, well-being, detoxing, and things like that. Celebrities. Tesco, for some reason, appears uh, to be highly um, involved in diabetes. Um, they have a lot of accounts, and <laughs> Tesco, yeah, they do. They have a big push uh, for uh, diabetes awareness and, and so on. Celebrities, and of course, the parody accounts that um, they always make it um, uh, to the top. The hubs is slightly <coughs> trickier because there are so many of them. The hubs means who's retweeting the influential people, and of course, they're influential because a lot of people retweet them. So finding the top 10 hubs uh, is hard. Most of them tend to be flat. And then they have one day of glory where they retweet the right person at the right time and they become important in this sense. So uh, we haven't been able to make much sense of this other than it's a highly fluid um, uh, field and, and perhaps calls for fresh ideas um, to understand this thing better. Um, so one of the things that uh, we did here is we bin the interactions in weekly, uh, we aggregated the interactions in weekly buckets. Uh, this is kind of arbitrary and not entirely satisfactory because, okay, so we saw that there was a sort of weekly pattern in the, in the connections, of, uh, in the number of tweets, so then we decided to do that. But in reality, it's very important and it's non-trivial how to choose the width of time of the bucket. So if you choose a very large time bucket, then you aggregate too many interactions. You destroy the nice, interesting temporal features <coughs> of the data. On the other hand, you aggregate your, you have a very fine temporal mesh, then you dissolve the structure of the network. You have nothing to work with. So I don't like this. I don't like discretizing time. I prefer to have things in continuous time. Um, so, so more recently, we've been trying to work on this, this question. So how to avoid um, aggregating things in time and discretizing. And for that, uh, we took inspiration from a paper in 2000 that uh, they say, well, you know, the strength of a tie between two individuals tends to diminish in time in the absence of interactions, which sounds you know, plausible enough. And, and so we say, fine, we're going to take data sets or, or model um, systems like a retweet network in time and make the distinction between the ties and the interactions. Um, so ties, we'll say, is the strength of the friendship, and the interactions are the individual events where these people <coughs> interact. And, and, and ties are nourished by interactions. So the few modeling assumptions that we made in order to make this mathematically tractable is that the strength of a tie decays exponentially in time. Um, and this allows us to talk about half-lives of ties. So when is the strength of your friendship half of what it was? And the other assumption that we've made is that every time you interact, then you strengthen your tie by one. So you're falling, decaying exponentially, you add one, you add it, and then you continue. And this is all that this means. So when we have no decay, it means we're just aggregating interactions. So this, decay, this alpha parameter is zero. So this is the tie strength of two individuals that have interacted four times. So at the end of the time, this tie strength is four. But if we allow decay, then we start to see how, how this thing might play along. Small alpha, you have a little decay. Larger alpha, slightly larger decay, slightly larger. By the time alpha is one, the first interaction doesn't matter um, by the time they interact a second time. They start from scratch. And they can build up, build momentum in their, in their friendship. Uh, but then if they neglect it, it dies away again. And again, you can make it so that you know, things matter only at the minute where they happen and then not after. Maybe this is uh, for a system where you say good morning to someone you don't know. Perhaps, <laughs> yeah, that person is important to you the 
brief seconds that you're saying good morning to them, but you know, once you stop, then it doesn't matter. Right? Um, and the data set that we used to test this idea was a uh, data set of tweets by about the NHS in English. So this is the, we took every tweet in English that contains the hashtag NHS. We took the 10,000 most active accounts just to kind of filter out all the stuff. And this is the number of retweets per day that these people achieve. And this is done during the time that the coalition government was trying to introduce some NHS reforms. So there was lively debates in, in July and in March. <coughs> so this is also an interesting data set. And what we've done is we've taken this um, tie strength network. So this is a network that changes in continuous time um, and looked at the temporal page rank. Uh, so again, we're using page rank, but every time that there's a new interaction, uh, you update your score, others decay, others grow. And then we say, okay, well, can we use this alpha parameter, the, the decay rate of the ties? in order to um, fine tune what we're looking for. So are we looking at things that are immediate and that are hot right now, like Hansel? No. Or, yeah, you got it. <laughs> or you're interested in more um, long-term um, trends and you say, well, yes, the interactions do accumulate. So when we tune <laughs> alpha so that the half uh, life of a tie is one hour, um, here, there's a lot of stuff going on here. So this shows the page rank score of the number one node. And every time someone new comes along, there's a new marker. So here's the green one, and then there's a purple one. That means that there's a new, a new kid in town. And the gray and white intervals just denotes when there's a regime change, when the number one node changes. So when the, the ties decay very fast, you see that you know, it's, it's, it's moving constantly. There's a new number one all the time. When the half-life is a day, then you see a little bit more stability, but every now and again there are events um, that uh, propel someone new. Uh, but in the end, kind of like the inertia of the accumulated interaction still manages to carry these two guys to dominate. And then when the half-life uh, half uh, half is a week, then it's a proper duopoly. It's just Ewing Clark and Marcus Chung who are activists um, that focus a lot on the NHS. So this is kind of nice because this is mathematically tractable, computationally efficient. You can turn on your alpha on and off, um, and then you can reveal uh, different things of your data without doing very drastic binning of an aggregating uh, of, of interactions in time. Um, how am I doing in time? Five minutes. OK. Um, this graph shows um, sort of the same story from a different point of view. We're showing rank instead of uh, page rank score. And we're just showing the timeline of the people who end up being the top five. Again, with half-life of an hour, a day, and a week. And I see we see how the rankings change widely. Uh, here, a little bit more stable here, and basically not much happens there. Um, right, so I don't have much time, but I will tell you a little bit of the work that we're doing using text. So you saw that we used sentiment before. But now we really want to exploit all this uh, wealth of data in the, in the tweets. So, so far we've looked at, so this is how I, I think of, of systems like Twitter. So you have people who are interacting, and this may be following each other, mentioning each other, liking, etc. But the people, they produce tweets, or they have their output, and you, you can analyze to produce, say, content units, for instance, topics. Right? And the topics may be related to each other, right? maybe overlapping in vocabulary and things like that. So one of our aims is to create this type of structure and then analyze them as a whole. Right? Um, so we started to do that um, and, and trying to see how they change in time. Um, so the first thing, oh yeah. So for those of you who will dig in into Twitter and analyze text, uh, be comfortable with throwing a lot of tweets away because a lot of tweets are garbage. Um, and so if you want to look at what, you know, the actual <laughs> topics and, and find something meaningful, you have to be prepared to throw a lot of tweets away. Um, so here's an example of topics about diabetes. Um, so we classify topics into five categories. So health, news, 
social interactions, banter and so on, commercial tweets, and then very bizarre feature called consist, uh, of consisting messages. Those are things that even though we're analyzing things over the course of a year, just keep appearing. People keep posting. <coughs> Among them uh, is this mathematics joke. Remember the, the, um, the red line I showed you? Well, this is it. Every day, <laughs> every day, hundreds of people are tweeting this. Juan eats uh, 40 chocolates, or has 40 chocolates, is 35, what does he have? Diabetes. <laughs> every day. <laughs> people are tweeting this between 100 and 1,000 times a day. <laughs> Not very original. By contrast, Tom Hanks revealed in October 2013 that he had type 2 diabetes, so it was a hot topic on Twitter, but then it kind of withered away. So stethoscope, <laughs> x-ray. <laughs> um, and one of the things that we're trying to do now is trying to analyze how <laughs> narratives evolve in time. So if you look at the topics and the lo topics that appear at a specific point in time, how do these topics change and how do the participation of the people change in them? So we've done that. So we created new networks where the nodes are topics and the connections denote that the same people or co-participation of authors in different topics. And then we let this thing evolve and we see, well, what happens? Well, how do the people change their conversations? So the top thing here is just the new cycle about the NHS. So the bill, privatization, the lords, the debate, Nick Clegg, homeopathy, etc. So that's okay, what we expected to find. But then we find groups of topics where the same sort of people participate. For instance, these red ones is mostly NHS employees. We're talking about working conditions, hiring. If we had continued the trend, we'd, we'd hear about junior doctors and um, antisocial hours and, and so on. Green ones are patient groups that are talking about quality of care, uh, accessibility of certain drugs, Viagra and things like that. Uh, so these are, again, things that persistently keep appearing. But then there are these flashes events, so like this blue one here and this purple one, where are highly topical. This is about some deaths in a Staffordshire hospital. So the people who interacted around these topics never interacted before with each other or significantly with each other. But they all came together, they talked about this, and then they dissipated. Same thing with a debate about uh, liberal Democrats in the NHS bill. So again, we see something like more structural, more persistent, and something that just appears and goes away. And um, I think that's pretty much it. So just to recap, say, if you're analyzing Twitter, <laughs> you have to be mindful of the, of the question that you, have, that you wanna answer and that will dictate the modeling choices that you make, the types of networks that you do, whether you analyze temporal or not. Um, we can look at, again, communities, roles, uh, text. Uh, and our ambition is to go on to full data structures and incorporate all data interactions and text and be able to get a really crisp, knitted picture of how people interact about events. Um, all, all my papers are here, so you can download them. And if you have any questions, email me. And yeah, thank you so much for your attention.